Sayama Puliago Gaba Malia, Ngaya Bronwyn Cochran, Gunima Ngay, Gunima Gamilroy Ngu. So what I just said there was, hello and good morning, friends. My name is Bronwyn Cochran. Um, I belong to my motherland, the Gamilaroi motherland. And as we gather around this digital campfire, as I like to call it, I'd like to extend a warm welcome and acknowledge the traditional custodians of the diverse lands that we are gathering on across this nation. I'd like to pay my respects to the traditional custodians of the lands on which I am joining you from today, beautiful Gumbangir, saltwater country. I would also like to acknowledge and pay my respects to my ancestors, the Gamilaroi peoples, and acknowledge the First Nations mob who have cared for this land for countless generations and whose enduring connection to country enriches the tapestry of our shared knowledge. We acknowledge their wisdom, their resilience, and the intrinsic relationship between land, people, and culture that is woven into the fabric of First Nations traditions. So I'm truly thrilled to be in the faith space with you all for our last Science Week webinar, uh, which we've been running all week. We've covered topics such as Indigenous astronomy, AI, blockchain, and how Indigenous knowledge knowledges can work with that. We've covered bush tucker, Indigenous sustainability and the and how that works in future industry. And today, the last of our five um, series webinar, we will be focusing on Indigenous tools and weapons and the science involved in creating these. So if this is your first webinar, um, as I said, my name is Bronwyn Cochran, but please call me Bonnie. I have over 25 years experience in education spanning from preschool to secondary. I am passionate about weaving the diverse tapestry of First Nations knowledges, histories and cultures into Australia's educational narrative as well as systems. As the founder and director of TIPIAC, my mission has been to create a space and authentic educational resources to showcase how easy it really is to embed First Nations perspectives and how it can thrive in our school curriculums, which then bridges the, our ancient wisdom with contemporary learning. So now let me introduce you to an Aboriginal torchbearer, if you like, of old age techniques and knowledge and the visionary be, behind Womble Woodworks, Josh Sly. Josh belongs to the beautiful lands of Biripai, Waramai and Wiradjuri lands. Josh's deep connection to his heritage propels his passion for cultural education. As the CEO and an artist and a cultural education officer, Josh's journey journeys through the integration of traditional knowledge and contemporary aspirations. So with Eight years of experience in education, he specialises in nurturing connections to culture through art, dance, language, traditional tool making. He has a profound relationship with country. So Josh's presence here today will illuminate the physics and chemistry that underlies the Indigenous tools and weapons crafted by our ancestors. He embodies the living link between past wisdom and future innovation. And we are truly honoured to have him guide us through this intricate dance of science, culture and connection. So thank you, Josh, for being here with us today. And may the warmth of this digital fire of knowledge nourish our spirits and connect us deeper to the in-depth knowledge systems of First Nations ways of being, doing and knowing. So I'll hand it over to you, Josh. Thank you, Bonnie. So, um, yeah, just in my language as well, I'll just say, Yiradu uh, Marang, Bu Yama Malia, Yuanyandi, Josh Lai, Baladu, Biripai, Waramai, Radri Guri. 
uh, Yinjimara Mandangu, Diromara Marang, uh, Norambang, uh, Yinjimara Mandangu, Diromara Marang, Gibobang. Um, so yeah, in my language, I just said good day and hello, friends. Uh, my name is Josh Sly. I'm a proud Birabai Warama and Radri man. So um, got bloodline connections pretty much all the mid north. Um, Mid North Coast from Port Macquarie, pretty much right down to Newcastle, and then across into Singleton, and then also uh, out the Central West, Bathurst, and then uh, out towards Parks and and that area. So, yeah, uh, very very blessed and um, feel very privileged uh, privileged to be here with you, Bonnie, and uh, for you mob that are joining virtually. Um, in my language as well, I just sent my good respects. Um, and thank you and good spirits to country and to people. Um, I'm out here on the beautiful lands of the Darik, um, Darik Nation um, here in Western Sydney. So I'd just like to also acknowledge um, their connection to this place, um, to country, to our old people, uh, and also acknowledge that we live in an intertribal space now with uh, many mobs living off country or living on other people's country um sometimes it gets taught you know funny that there's all these big imaginary fences or um you know that these boundaries were really strict and we we're never on other people's country but we're always you know with respect on other people's country for trade for ceremony um for doing business but also country all of us and that's a I think a really important way to look at it all is that you know our waters went ran across multiple countries we share square country all the critters and non-human kin that are on my country are on your country as well so our, our kinship system uh looked deeper and knew that we're all interconnected and interrelated in one way shape or form as well so just like to acknowledge that and um, extend that acknowledgement to everyone here today and thank you for sharing this space and taking the time out of your day to jump on the webinar and um yeah hopefully I can share a bit of knowledge with you and um not the best with technology so please bear with me I'm, I'm used to doing this uh, um live in person so this is a new and uh beautiful learning opportunity for myself as well so yeah, in saying that, um, yeah, I'm the the CEO founder of Womble Woodworks. So Womble, um, for us, is the traditional name for the Macquarie River that run, runs through our country. So we say Bila Womble Norambang, which is our Womble River country, where the people of the three rivers, the Womble, uh, the Galari, and the Murrumbidgee. So I just like to also acknowledge that. Um, and yeah, before I start, I just also like to acknowledge all the people um, that have spoken to me, my old people, um, elders, elders from other communities um, that have spoken into me and shared this knowledge. This is not just mine. Uh, it's not mine to keep. It's it's mine to hold and to take care of and, and to share with, uh, with everyone, not just Aboriginal people, but um, all people that share our beautiful country. So um, in saying that, if we look at that photo, um, second from the right there, that's a photo of me when I was uh, about 15 or 16 and, um, out on country there with uncle Ralph Naden, um, and Doug Gordon. And that was really, I guess, the starting of my journey into tool making. That was the first time I went out and cut, uh, did redoing the process of tool making goes deeper cutting down timber, shaping it, um, and having the end product. It's the all all the indirect learning that happens from walking country, connecting to country, connecting to our elders and knowledge holders that take the time to share this knowledge. Um, it goes so much deeper, as I said, than just walking out, cutting down a tree. Um, the whole process is learning, is connection, um, that transfer of energy, even that spiritual lens of um asking country permission to walk, to take. Um, and then obviously that goes into our traditional law of not, not taking things that aren't yours, not abusing country, not um, degrading country and degrading our people and ourselves as well. So hopefully I can share a little bit of that uh, throughout this presentation as well, that it goes so much deeper than just the science and the process. There's a whole spiritual uh, and cultural lens of tool making as well, which I'm, um, feel very blessed to be um have been shared that knowledge from our old people so in saying that um links perfectly i guess into this next slide of our sustainable practices i know you hear a lot about um i guess in the ignorant comments that you know we didn't invent the 
reinvent the wheel or do things like this. But our old way of doing business was so much more sophisticated than people give us credit for. The way that I was taught when we're walking on country, we're walking with country and we're um, utilising um, the gifts that country give us, we're always thinking six, seven, eight generations ahead. We're never over um, overtaking country abusing country or never taking anything more than we needed and it's a beautiful way of of being and doing and it reminds us um coming back to that kinship system that we are connected and have a responsibility for our country uh for our people and for our future generations um and i guess a perfect example of that is these scar trees as well our scar trees are a beautiful reminder um of working sustainable, not chopping down the whole tree, not not taking that spirit and killing that tree. With our scar trees, as you can see in that little diagram, we cut into through this to the sap layer and we stop when we hit hit the hardwood and it's what it's called. So when you're chopping into that tree, you actually hear the change in the sound. It'll go the stone axe traditionally or now with our modern metal axes, you'll hear the sound change, chop, 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 and then it'll hit and go hard and that's how you know not to cut any further into that wood and that's when we're doing our our, our gulamons our coolamons and our shields um and only taking that layer of that bark and as you can see the regrowth that it, it heals just like us as people uh if we cut ourselves or you know we we still can live breathe grow and learn and that's the same for our tree we're only just leaving a scar um which in some areas if it has uh great water um it will grow back a lot quicker um some stay open and they're just that visual reminder these are the two photos um here i wanted to show show you mob two because sometimes when we're getting taught about scar trees people only talk about the ones or the shields but over on the right here this um this is a photo from one of the unks that shared knowledge with me over in WA. And this is actually a boomerang scar tree. So again, only taking what we need, cutting in, uh, not ring, ring barking the tree as well. Um, see a lot of comments as well in this modern world on Facebook when we're posting up photos like this and, oh, you're killing the tree and things like that. But that's not the case. Um, this won't ring, ring bark the tree. Uh, this tree will continue to grow and live. And then this tree here is actually a Woomera um, scar tree as well. So a little bit different on this one. We're actually chopping in deeper and actually getting into that beautiful hardwood. So um, our old people knew the difference between what woods were used for what type of tools, whether it be um, light and compact for our cooler ones, which were carried long distances. We didn't want them to be heavy. Um, they're dense the bark is dense and strong um, and same with our shields as well, that light weight. So it's movable um, with your reflexes, but still having that strength. Whereas our boomerangs and woomeras um, and tools that were thrown and had a lot of impact, we needed to go into that heartwood, um, that strong, tough wood. Um, and that's what you can see there in those two scar trees. So our way of doing and being, um, as you can see, our old people had have had the chance to master these skills and I feel very privileged to be in the position that I am now um, on the back of 65,000 plus 80,000, 120,000 years of this experimental learning and learning through doing and being and trial and error. And that's a, a beautiful thing, I think, when we're not just talking about tool making, but something to teach our kids as well. Um, you know, you practice by making mistakes, by learning, by that science of having a hypothesis of thinking, oh, well, I could do this and figuring it out through that trial and error, what works, what doesn't work. And yeah, as I said, I feel very lucky that I'm sort of at the back end of still have trial and error and figuring things out for myself, but also mastering what the old people had already done uh, in that in that area. Always like to start uh, with our stone axe and our stone tools. Um, I think this is one of 
the most important tools. It teaches us responsibility uh, and respect. So there's the moral side of once you have a stone axe, you can go and cut down anything you want. But coming back to that traditional law and values of only taking what you you need and um, having that discernment and responsibility in yourself to look after country, even though you've got the tool to go and cut things down. So our stone axe heads were predominantly made uh, from our river stones, inclu including basalt and sourced along uh, water systems and natural quarries. They were chosen um, due to their smooth shape. So again, country has helped shape these stones, but also their strength and durability. Um, these stones, again, linking deeper to just the tool making our stone axes were traded right across the country many areas not having uh these these links to those type of stones as well um so you see our natural trade routes um and the way that we shared which is a beautiful thing as well that sometimes doesn't get mentioned that stone axes and some even for local um context some sydney stones from the area that I'm living in, the Hawkesbury, uh, Penrith area, we're very lucky here to have access to a lot of these natural resources and these traditional stones. And when we look at these trade routes, some with modern day science, they show, and it's beautiful that science is now proving what we've been saying for over 200 years, that we were connected, we did trade, um, and we did have processes and procedures. And, the stone axe is an example of that um, in the fact that Sydney stones have been found all the way in central Australia, um, which is, it's amazing when you look at how far in kilometers when, and how many country groups, uh, language groups that that would have had to pass through to get to parts of central Australia as well. So these stone axes uh, were sharpened uh, using water, and sandstone so you see these big outcrops and this photo here in the bottom right actually comes from um a very special place out at the back of dubbo there which is our terror among the mine and there there's a big big stories in that but also um shows how we sharpen these tools so most of these outcrops were close to water and again water was um essential in this process of not clogging up the stone and helping create that smooth passage uh, of stone to stone so you'll see um a lot of these are in sort of like a, a overly diamond shape and that's from going back and forth and then flipping it over and even this taught us um patience taught us um to not rush the process but also when i've been doing these stone axes it's, it's also taught me the practice of being being present um in a modern day we're so overstimulated with computers phones even i'm so guilty of it just turning on the tv or having noise in the background for no reason um but our old people knew how to sit in the silence and sit in the process and just sit with country and sit with the sounds and just listening and tuning into what country is telling us. I've um, got a little video just to show um, the process of how uh, we grinded these stone axes. So this one's just the um, one that I use when I go to schools. This is a type of sandstone as well. So again, using that traditional knowledge in a bit of a contemporary way, this was just an off cut snap from a quarry. Um, but it's still, as I said, using that traditional knowledge systems. So you can see there how it goes from, from start to finish. And even in the handle, um, 
of these stone axes actually has has science um in them so you'll see a lot of nowadays you'll see people as we're trying to recreate that those knowledge systems of the stone axe which is important to note that in our more modern history with the introduction of metal and different glass and uh, modern day tools our old people sat down the stone the stone axe over 100 years ago um, again working smarter not harder with the introduction as i said of metal but still applying that traditional knowledge so as tool makers are recreating um, and bringing back that knowledge it's important that we do it correctly so if you look at this photo of this stone axe you can see the handle looks a little bit different to what you might have seen. So what we and what I was shown from my uncle was we actually use the grass tree stems. We would wet them um, and then use the hammer rock or the stone axe to soften up the fibres on this point and then would actually fold it over the stone axe, use our resin um, and our traditional rope either sinew or stringy bark to tie it up. And the reason we did this and didn't use a hardwood handle, um, again, is coming back to that science and that ingenuity. With this handle, it actually allows for movement within a stone axe. So sort of similar, I guess, to cracking a whip, the, um, the grass tree stem has the flex in it, which helps provide... Um, more strength velocity and as i said that flick motion so again working smarter not harder so we're using the stone axe and not tying ourselves out with that flick motion again it also helps with the integrity of the glue um, and the string um, and not snapping snapping the wood as well so there's a whole lot of small um it might seem small, but a whole lot of knowledge is in just this stone axe um, that we need to keep alive. Because um, as I said, with the introduction of modern tools, now we go straight to our chainsaws um, and our metal axes and things like that. But there's a whole process uh, with our stone axes. Another amazing um skill uh, and tool and tool making process was napping um, and this one here it's important that for me to note as well that I, I'm still on my cultural journey um, and still learning and again this is a, a skill that sort of has been sat down as well now with the introduction of metal with knives um, and things like that but it's Again, something that I've been lucky enough to have been shared a bit of knowledge with my uh, a bit of knowledge with from one of my uncles. Um, so the napping process um, is about striking two stones, uh, stones together, usually a hammer stone, and then you have your core stone or or the stone that's being napped. There's many different words for this um, process. Some call it flaking, napping, um, and things like that. The beautiful thing about this um, is it's so intricate and there's so much knowledge in what people might just walk past and think there's broken rocks on the ground on country. But rocks, again, we need to look at the properties, the materials, um, what's a hard rock. So if we skip back to our stone axe, they were chosen, as I said, by the materials and the properties, which you can look at science, you can look at the periodic table to see those chemical and those natural compounds that make up our stone axe rocks that we obviously didn't want to splinter or to be flaking once we've sharpened the edge whereas these ones it's sort of the opposite that we needed them to be pliable enough to shatter to flake um, and to nap but without being weak enough that it's just going to completely shatter and that in itself is a is a beautiful art form um that some people still are lucky enough to have the knowledge of. And um, something that I didn't know until I learned this off my uncle is rocks actually have grains as well, which makes sense when you look at the colour. So just like wood, our stones had a grain and to nap them correctly, you actually have to know how to, how to read the grain. So it's not just about 
breaking the rock and just guessing there's an art to it where you're watching the grain you're looking at what way the rock has been formed and then I guess going from I guess deconstructing that so working backwards of looking where to to flake and where to nap and where to shatter the rock and again you can look at um the periodic table and, and the science goes so deep on what uh stones we use for our napping but once they were napped um we made many tools um including scraping and carving for our wood to help us with our wood tools so again nowadays we have sandpaper and rafts traditionally we would use our napped or our flaked uh, rocks we also would use kangaroo bones uh, and animal bones would make chisels they were also used for knives um, for cutting meat uh, skinning animals they were a skinning tool um, and my uncle was telling me um, there's actually a research paper out on on our napping knives and some of them are sharper than these new serrated metals and glass Unfortunately, the only downside when we're looking at, I guess, contemporary versus traditional, some of these uh, rocks didn't hold their sharpness. So as you can see in this bottom photo, when we're napping, we'd have to collect and try and keep as many pieces. Um, if they were continually used, um, they were compromised and they did snap and they did lose their edge. Whereas nowadays with metals, we can just keep sharpening them and they they hold their edge so there's a little bit of that that difference but again if we come back to our traditional knowledge to get these metals and different things now we have to mine so we're actually destroying and and killing and breaking traditional law of of not killing and hurting country and not over using and um leaving a negative impact on our country so it's that give and take that, yeah, it didn't hold its its sharpness as well as these modern day, but it didn't have any impact on the environment. These are all biodegradable when you look at our boomerangs, our stone axe handles, even the stones. It all comes from country and can go back to country without having any waste, um, which is a really important thing to note as, as well. One of my favourites, and this one's a great uh, one for if there's any teachers um, on the webinar as well, is, is our traditional glue and looking at uh, different compounds um, and different materials and how we can mix them together uh, to make, make what we need to make. So our traditional glue, some areas, especially the desert mob, they, they had the beautiful Spinifex resin, which didn't need um, any extra additives. The chemical uh, compound within, its within itself was enough um, to make to make super glue. What I love about this, um, as I said, it has so much science in it. Uh, when you look at these three ingredients by themselves, so we've got the grass tree resin, charcoal, uh, and kangaroo poo. They, on their own, are, I guess, not as strong when you look again into the science and people have done the comparisons. Grass tree resin on its own can be used as a glue. The only problem with uh the grass tree resin when we don't add these other things in it's very likely to shatter um it's not as strong um and it and as i said it can crack but when we add the three together adding the the charcoal and the kangaroo poo and the kangaroo poo is actually one of the most important elements due to the way that kangaroos only eat vegetation and the way that their body breaks it down um and then when it's in the form of kangaroo poo, it, it works as a binder. So it binds the other two and creates that really strong uh, bond. So as I said, the process involves a collection of the three materials. Um, I might play this video while, while I talk. So um, the collection of the three materials, then what we do, we crush them down into sort of like a powder. So we crush them all down as you can see in the video, again, utilizing country 
Uh, we have our hammer rock there, our grinding rock to crush it all down. Once it's all um, crushed down into a powder, we mix them all together. And again, this is a great one um, for teachers talking about ratios as well. Um, and this is uh, just amazes me that our old people knew all of this without using measuring cups or um, scales and different things that we have lucky enough to have nowadays that it was all just, again, from that trial and error um, and figuring out on the go. So the ratio is really important as well. Um, if you have not enough or too much of each, um, when we heat them up, it won't turn into a proper paste and then, and then it also won't harden. So again, if we're talking about that science, we're going from three separate solids into one, turning it into a powder, then using heat manipulation to turn it into a liquid, um, a liquid paste, and then letting it dry. And then once it sets, it sets hard like, like tar. So it, that's sort of the best comparison that I can give is on a hot day when you see that the tar melting on the road, that's, that's what this looks like when you heat it up and then it sets and then it's good to go. This is one of my favorites and one um, that I love teaching about. So the Woomera or Wuma, they both actually come from my language, Radri language. So the Woomera um, is a spear thrower. I, I love this one. Um, you see it in some old movies and that. And I just love the ingenuity around it. Um, again, for all um the teachers out there this is this is a funny one that I love to do with the kids that um I guess brings our traditional knowledge um and understanding into the modern world and and really connects kids with what the woman actually does so I always get asked when I go out to schools and that oh why you why you got a dog thrower um so I'll explain why that why I have the dog thrower so yeah, again, for all, all the primary school teachers or or for anyone, really, if you want to introduce the Woomera to your young mob um, or to your kids at home, the dog thrower is a perfect example. So if we look at why we use a dog thrower, so helps the ball go further, helps the ball go faster, uh, we get more leverage, we get more power, we get more speed, it helps make it more accurate. It also links into biomechanics of the body. Um, it puts less stress on your elbow, shoulder, and wrist joint. Um, so again, usually we as humans get tired before the dog. <laughs> um, helps you continue, obviously, to play with your dog. So now if we take all of that contemporary, they actually took all of that from our traditional knowledge system of the Woomera. So for us, the Woomera... Um, for those that don't know, he's a spear thrower. It helps um, with our hunting. It becomes an extension of our arm. So it creates a greater distance uh, between the wrist and elbow, which are our pivot points. So this is where we're bringing in maths and physics into the science of our pivot point. So if we are extending the pivot point and creating a greater angle, it creates more leverage, it generates more for force, which then in turn, as the same as a dog thrower, it allows the spear to go further, faster, more accurate, less stress on the joint. It also helps, obviously, with hunting techniques um, of not scaring the animal away. If we can throw the spear with more force and velocity from a further, further distance, um, again, we're working smarter, not harder. So for those that haven't seen a Woomera in, in practice, this is what it is here. Um, these, fo these photos here, two, two different styles of the, of the Woomera. So again, it's important when we're talking about all of this, it's the cultural context of country. Not everywhere in Australia used Woomeras. Some just used spears. Some used other ways of hunting, doing and being, whether that's manipulation through fire and through smoke uh, to scare animals into clearings. Um, some used 
different nets, uh, different corridors um, to throw the spear and to obviously get closer. But then for my mob uh, and a lot of the mobs I know, we also had had the warmer here as well. And with that, there was lots of different styles and shapes, um, carvings, um, again, all dependent on the area. So as you can see in that video, um, I didn't want to throw it too far because there's actually houses down the back, and I was, I was a bit, I was a bit worried that, um, you know, people see these spears going through the air, and yeah, I just didn't know what they would be thinking. But, um, I played the, the video one more time, but you can see how far the spear went with minimal, um. I guess body exertion as well. So again, coming back to that bio biomechanics, I wasted no energy, um, no stress on my joints or my muscles. Literally took the tiniest step and just threw the spear. So again, coming back to those angles with my front hand and my back hand or pinching the spear, we want to let go at 90 degrees. So the spear thrower, the spear as it comes up, that's the um, optimal point of transferring that um, force and velocity through my arm, through the Woomera, and then through the spear. So again, you can see how this uses the physics and also the mathematics. As, as it comes up, that's a perfect point to launch the spear. And again, I used no, wasted no energy. Um, so just imagine if I, I did put all my power and force into it, how far that would go and how easy, not easy, but again, how that transfers into working smarter, not harder when we're hunting um, our big animals, such as the kangaroos and emus, which that's what the, the spear was used for. So again, coming off the back of the woman, we obviously need our spears. Uh, um, these were primary hunting tool across the continent. And again, um, there was different ways and different styles and different methods of making spears. Um, again, I can only talk from the context that I've been shared. The spear shafts um, were typically made out of very pliable wood, allowing it to be straightened, allowing it um, also to have that aerodynamics as well through the air. So we didn't want to be using our strong um, heavy, dense wood. A lot of our woods would either use um, young sapling, so that sap wood. would also use um, young she oaks. But in some areas, which I know our people did and the Sydney people did, we also use the grass tree stems um, as a shaft. And when we're talking about these um, soft, softer woods, um, it's important to note that we added a hardwood tip again. So having that understanding of that balance between aero, aerodynamics, but also weight distribution as well. Um, or if the spear is too light, obviously it's just going to fly up um, and not go as far. It's going to get caught in the wind. So the wind's going to push it, lead it off course and things like that. So it was, a, it was a beautiful, I guess, balance as well of understanding that it needs to be lightweight. It also needs to be strong enough. And that's where the ply, pliable wood comes into it. And you can see there in that photo that I'm manipulating the wood with the fire. Um, so making sure it's straight, which again helps with accuracy um, and aerodynamics, but also um, with the pliable wood, when it's um, hitting the animal and things like that as well, there's the whole science of, of not just snapping um, and breaking, which is really important because we didn't want to be wasting time, obviously having to remake spears every time we're going hunting or if you miss and you snap your spear, well, then you're not eating today or tomorrow. <laughs> so again, having that, that um, our old people had that beautiful, balance figured out of understanding 
as I said, the aerodynamics and weight distribution, but also making sure that these tools and technologies were strong enough to last um, the practice that we were doing, which then again in turn link, links into that sustainability because that's not su sustainable if we're chopping trees down every single day, especially the saplings because that means they're not getting a chance to grow uh, into adult trees as well. So you'll see here in this video, this one here um, is a southern brush currajong. So again, having the understanding of the different trees that we use, and this is this is one that I was showing um, by the south coast mob. So this this these spear shafts come from down Yuan country as well. So again, while I'm talking and yarning about all of this, it's so important that we acknowledge all, all the different country groups and acknowledge. Um, I guess how blessed I am to be shared knowledge from across many country groups and their way of doing business and their way of knowing and, and their connection to country and where trees grow on certain countries, they don't on other, which then again, that links into our trade routes of sharing resources. Um, but also in that modern day um, context of, I guess, recreating different trade routes and, knowledge systems now that we have the ability to travel with cars and different things like that as well so that beautiful mixture of traditional but also contemporary ways of being and doing as well So in that video, you see um, I'm using uh, sinew to tie up the end. Again, what I love about these spear shafts as well is that it, they actually float as well. So these ones were um, perfect, not just for on land hunting, but these were utilized uh, for spear fishing as well. When they hit that fish, uh, they actually float on the water, which again, hunting technique that the fish won't swim down, keep swimming down and pull out of the spear shaft and will actually bring them up to the surface. Um, and again, working smarter, not harder, easier to go and grab, not having to dive down uh, for your spear shaft as well. So talking about the kangaroo sinia, again, um, we need to... I guess, jump into that spiritual lens now as well of um, how we pay respects to country, pay respects to our non-human kin. As I said before, all these critters and animals sit in the kinship system. So that means that um, we need to recognise that that important seesaw of protection and obviously use. And that's where our totem systems come into it as well. And what I was taught... Um, is we pay respects to these animals by using everything that we can, not wasting anything. So when we're hunting kangaroo, obviously the skin and the fur would skin the animal and that would use for clothing and blankets. The meat uh, was obviously cooked and shared. And even that is a knowledge system in itself of who gets to eat what meat um, as well. Uh, and that's really important coming back to that respect ways of elders, knowledge holders, kids, um, what meat you could eat. Right down to the bones, as I said before, the bones were used um, for sewing needles, would sharpen the bones for sewing needles, for jewellery. Yes, we had jewellery. Um, also for chisels. Um, so mo <clears throat> multiple use, use of the bones. And then, of course, the sinew. Um, and I was just reading, um, Bonnie and I were yarning about it last night. That I was just reading the other day about, um, the biomechanics of the body and our, the strength of our, uh, ligaments and tendons in our knees. And they were doing research, um, per tiny millimeter. When you look at our ACL joints is actually stronger than some modern day steel, and then I was just, my mind went straight to, well, kangaroos are way stronger than us. Look at the, such a solid animal. So imagine um, the strength of the sinew of the ligaments of the kangaroo, especially in their legs and their tails. And that's where we got our sinew. 
so again um there's science in all of that even um the way that we made the string pliable so what i was taught and what our old people did we actually put the sinew in our mouth so nowadays um we've got fridges and freezers so we don't waste it when we go out hunting if we're not going to use the sinew straight away we can actually freeze it in the water defrost it make it wet and then use it traditionally obviously would be trying to use it straight away um, not letting it dry out and crack but what we do is as I said, we put the sinew in our mouth, makes it more pliable. It, um, again, I'm sure there's science in that adding our saliva um, changes the makeup of the sinew. And then when it dries, this is my favorite part, when the sinew dries, it actually compresses and shortens. So it's forever getting tighter on whatever you're binding up. So again, um, that exchange of, the sun of the elements drying it out is a chemical reaction that's that's causing the string to compress like a spring uh, and tighten up whatever we're tying up. So we come back to our glue. They're a perfect mixture of the glue, as you can see on the left here, um, using that traditional glue and also the sinew as well. So I was always taught to put the sinew first, compresses, glue over the top of that to protect it and then you can do another layer to tighten and compress it all up on the end as well brings us to one uh, australian icon um even i was recently uh overseas early in the year um and when I was saying um, Aboriginal Australian, they're oh the boomerang, the boomerang. So everyone knows, uh, everyone knows the boomerang. Um, most people know of the returning boomerang due to a beautiful thing called tourism. <laughs> uh, our boomerangs weren't toys in the way that you see it be shared in a modern day um, way. Yes, we had traditional games for our young people using small boomerangs, small thin boomerangs that weren't sharpened to the edge. Similar, I guess, in a way now you can play catch with the footy or play bombs. I remember that was one of my favourite games where you kick it up and see who can catch it. Again, we had games like that um, where the kids would throw the boomerang, it would spin and you'd try and see who could jump up the highest and catch it. Again, this was an indirect way um, of learning as well how to correctly throw the boomerang. So with our boomerangs, we didn't just only have that returning. Um, as I said, it wasn't like a toy that you see these days. It was still a hunting tool. This was thrown up into the air to hunt uh, birds, things that would fly. So either if it was over a top of a body of water, you would cast stones into the water and scare them up and try and throw it into the flop, like the flight path. It was also used to scare, um, again, working smarter, not harder. We'd set up nets, especially low-lying birds or low-lying trees, and the sound of the boomerang as it spins actually scares the birds, and as they go to fly up, we could trap them in the net. We had our hunting boomerangs and our musical or ceremonial boomerangs as well. So we had many different types of boomerangs, different shapes. Um, I think it's really important to note, and I wanted to share this with, with you all. If you look up here in the right corner, you can see the grain is running straight across. This is a fake boomerang. So our old people knew, and anyone that does would work knows that you have to work with the grain um, and you don't want to compromise the integrity or the strength of whatever tool you're making by making things cross grain or anything like that so you can see that this one's just been cut out of a big sheet so that's it I just wanted to share that with you mob as well if anyone's purchasing um, boomerangs or resource kits or if you're in school or even just for your house this one will snap nine times out of 10 when it hits the ground due to the, the grain um, not running with the timber. So our traditional boomerangs, all the different shapes, some people get confused as why they're different shapes. It all come down to the natural curvature of the branch and the tree. 
So we cut our boomerangs out of um, the branches, but we also cut them out of the root systems as well. And when you see these ones that are made by Aboriginal people by a crop, and that was so we didn't, um, again, compromise the strength or the integrity, which our old people had figured out. Again, coming back to the types of wood and the strength, um, this here, these ones here were probably more used for ceremonial or for music. The yellow is a sapwood. Um, if you're continually throwing these boomerangs, you didn't want to be using sapwood. So coming back again to that diagram of the tree, we wanted to get into the heartwood um, again, for that durability, for that strength. Um, and again, not wasting boomerangs. If we're making them out of the sapwood, they're going to snap. And as we said with the spears and we're not going to eat and then we're wasting country as well. So even the science of knowing the tree, knowing what types of tree, knowing how far to cut in to the tree and use, use the correct resources. And then the other beautiful thing, um, there's so much um, physics and science in the actual um use of the boomerang and how it um how it flies especially returning one but also a hunting tool so the way my uncle explained it and a good way to remember it um, and a funny way to remember it it's like a dog chasing their tail trying to catch their tail so if you look at this diagram as we throw these boomerangs there's greater force on the top end um and then as it quarter turns and then less on the bottom end. So it's that continual rotation, which again was important for our hunting ones. Um, they were thrown, I guess, more at hip height and sort of more Frisbee style and that helped them spin. And if you actually throw them and hit the animal correctly, that front side will hit. And then due to that aerodynamic force, the back side will actually continue to spin and trip the animal over. So again, very, very smart, um, smart way of doing business. But if we come back to the returning boomerang, um, again, this uses um, so much physics in the air drag um, and the aerodynamics and also the weight distribution of the boomerang, making sure the curvature um, is crafted enough to have that um, stability, but not heavy enough to get stuck or to just drop down, which again links into environmental science of using the winds. Our old people knew how to use um, the wind. Um, some people think that you can just go and just throw a boomerang and it'll always, always come back, but we actually had to check the wind direction and you wanted to throw it into the wind. So as it spins around and comes back, the wind will actually pull it and that air drag will bring it and make it... Um, nice and accurate and return to you as well so no we're running out of time so i won't go too much more into that but um i guess that's a good starting platform and you can go and do your own research we can't talk about the uh boomerang and not mention uncle david so um uncle david unipon very famous inventor um if anyone's seen a $50 note before, you would have seen this man. Um, he was an early inventor, um, writer, poet, activist. Um, his credentials could, just could go on all day. Um, one of the things that he's in particular very famous for, um, which you can see on the $50 note, is a sheep shearer. He was the first person, um, one of the first people to invent that style of sheep shearer. One thing he's not as famous for, unless you do your research, unfortunately, is uh, he was one of the first people using uh, the boomerangs like this to figure out perpetual motion. So again, physics and science um, could talk about this all day, but he figured out using that aerodynamics, that wind drag and that perpetual motion. He drew one of the first concept designs for the helicopter and the helicopter propeller. 
unfortunately due to the time period um he wasn't allowed to get that um design painting um i think i said that right um and unfortunately now a frenchman gets all the credit for or um the helicopter because he took david's uh design and ideas and he was the one that went and then took it and got it painted and yeah so now unfortunately when you look up the history books the french uh get the credit for the helicopter but it was actually uncle david here again using that traditional knowledge of the boomerangs um of that aerodynamics and also perpetual motion as well so so this one's a good one um, again for the primary school and high school to talk about um, history, our modern history, our traditional knowledge, but also the unjust and unfair treatment <clears throat> of our old people uh, within Australia and within society as well. So thank you for joining and it was very valuable, Josh. Thank you from the bottom of my heart because, you know, the things that you've covered today from, you know, especially how you started this whole learning process when you were 15 and then talking about the stone axe and the trading and even linking the trading maps and, you know, how that then goes into our song lines and knowledge of land, the, um, you know, the sustainable practices on country, spears, woomeras, kangaroo sinew boomerangs like all of that knowledge is just so um rich and diverse for each nation so I'm just really so thankful um for you to share your sad day morning <laughs> with us so thank you so much Josh thank you thanks again for having me Bonnie and yeah it's been a pleasure getting to continue to work with you and um, the Tibiac team and yeah, big shout out to everyone that's made this happen and also everyone that like participated, as I said at the start, like feel very blessed to share this space with everyone and um, yeah, feel very honoured to be able to share this knowledge, I guess, at such a young age. It's, um, it enriches my life, everything. By the, from the time I wake up to the time I go to sleep, every decision and everything I do is for my culture and people. So I love it. Um it's yeah it's my purpose and my why and just yeah I feel blessed to be able to share it and it makes me happy that people are interested and you know hopefully everyone here can take at least something back to your own community or your classroom or your kids or nieces nephew whoever it is you know it's all about them ripple effects and just having those yarns and um yeah there's so many more research like resources and videos and different things out there if you want to you know continue the deep dive and as was mentioned before i'd really suggest looking at that first um the first people's the tools and weapons and the first technology that um series um mm -hmm. talks about yeah, was that on abc or yeah i think you can watch it on abc or something yeah yeah, yeah. But no, I just said, look that up. They'll be able to find it on. Um, yeah, it should. I Google it. Alrighty, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us on this Saturday morning. Enjoy the rest of your weekend, and yeah, thank you. We will see you again soon in our next series of webinars. Yellow. Thank you.